this week we'll be talking about foodways and economics. And so specifically, we will look at how people find, make, and eat food, as well as how they work, share, and buy things. You know, this capitalist model that we see in these industrialized or post-industrial nations is not the way that we've lived for the bulk of our human existence. So we'll start with the components of the human diet. Um, first of all, there is no universal human diet. There's no one way that people eat. Um, we've seen over the past hundred years increasing homogenization of food production. We see monoculture, we see industrialized agriculture, etc. However, there's still, even with that, tremendous cultural variation in how people find, make, eat, and relate to food. We are omnivores. You know, that's really what we evolved to be. We did not evolve to be fruit eaters. We did not evolve, I mean, though we did evolve from fruit eating ancestors, but we did not evolve to be vegetarians. We also didn't evolve to be like obligate carnivores, right? We are omnivores. And that is part of what is behind our incredible adaptability and ability to live in such a wide range of ecological niches. Our actual diets don't consist of everything, um, but really a pretty limited range of plants and animals. This is determined by what's available, by biological restrictions. We can't, for example, live on a 100% meat diet. Um, that's counterproductive to our health, though there are some human societies like the Inuit and Klinklet uh, who have about 80% of their diet based in sea mammals. Um, it relates to our cultural practices and it relates to our own preference, right? We've all got foods we don't like. I don't like olives, for example, and I can taste even the slightest bit of olive as an ingredient in, in anything um, and it turns me off of the whole food. Olive oil, by contrast, I'm fine with. So, you know, we all have unique kinds of relationships with food. We do, however, eat a tremendous variety of things. The human diet really evolved not to be a specialist, but to be incredibly fluid and adaptable. So what do we owe our evolutionary to our evolutionary heritage? Well, around 6 million years ago, our primate ancestors were largely tree-dwelling fruit eaters and had a diet that was dominated by plant materials. I mean, in essence, we split off from chimpanzees about six to eight million years ago. Um, and our earliest, what we call hominins or bipedal upright locomotors, um, you know, they're basically bipedal apes, um, were still living in the forest, still eating forest foods, which were predominantly fruit. Um, roughly, uh, really anywhere from about five million years ago to about two million years ago, we shifted out onto the African savanna. And the African savanna has very different resources than the forest does. When we think about tropical forests, we have this variable that we call bulk of the biomass, okay? And that is where the bulk of living organized tissue, plant material, et cetera, animal material uh, is. And in forests, the bulk of the biomass is above ground. Um, the depth of root systems like tree roots and stuff in tropical forests is only like six inches to a foot. So when there's a bad windstorm in tropical areas, trees fall over because they don't have deep roots. Um, animals are generally fairly small bodied in forests. We don't have what we consider giganticism. When we look at the savanna or any kind of arid environment, even desert New Mexico, by contrast, we find that the bulk of the biomass is underground. Have you ever seen anyone dig up a yucca? I mean, sometimes the yucca tap roots can go down 30 or more feet. Uh, you can't just dig up a yucca by hand. You really need to have heavy machinery like a crane to be able to pull up a yucca with its tap roots intact. Um, so when we move into arid climates, the plant materials develop really deep um, penetrating root systems to get down at the water that's generally farther underground than it is in these tropical kinds of climates. And then when you think about the animal materials that are present in savannas, I mean, think about elephants, right? We've got forest elephants or what we call Asian elephants, and we've got savanna dwelling elephants or African elephants. There's a big size differential with Asian elephants much smaller than their African uh, contemporaries. So we see bigger body sizes in animals and we see deeper roots in uh, plants. And really for this period from about five to two million years, 
we had a group of fossil hominins called the Australopiths. That includes Lucy. Uh, if you've ever heard anything about Australopithecus um, afarensis, and they were specialized plant eaters, um, but they were going for specific kinds of plant resources. They weren't picking fruits, for example. There's not a lot of fruits in savannas. What they were going for were roots and tubers. So our love of potatoes, sweet potatoes, etc. we owe our evolutionary ancestry for to. Uh, to. So at about 3.3 to 2.6 million years, this is farther back than what your textbook states. Um, your textbook is not written by um, evolutionary anthropologists. Uh, our oldest tool use associated with animal bones goes back to about 3.3 million years ago. Um, so that is where we really started a shift towards omnivory. Uh, this was through opportunistic scavenging, where we were finding kills that weren't accessible to our competitors. Our main competitors were like lions and hyenas. Well, what can they not do? They can't climb trees. So there are cats like leopards and jaguars and such um, that cache their kills in trees precisely because lions can't reach them. So um, in that context, we were able to successfully, being evolved from apes, we were able to successfully climb trees. We were able to opportunistically scavenge from those kills. Somewhere between about 1.8 and 1 million years ago, and again, this is a little more, a little older than what your uh, textbook states, we see a shift towards hunting. Um, and really the first quote unquote hunter gatherer was Homo erectus. Uh, who appears in the fossil record around 1.8 million years ago. Um, one important thing about hunting of uh, early Homo is that you know, we, were, we were engaging in cooperative hunting. We were hunting much the same as traditional hunter-gatherers hunt today. Um, this allowed us to cooperatively hunt. This allowed us to consume meat more regularly and in greater quantities. When you cooperatively hunt, you don't increase the amount of meat brought back per kill per se. But what you do is you have a greater likelihood uh, with food sharing that somebody will have been successful that day. Now, Homo erectus wasn't that great at hunting, wasn't going after dangerous or elusive prey, wasn't really going after prey that was highly armored or anything like that. You know, think about woolly mammoths with their massive body size and tusks, but really, really quite successful and some interesting cultural abilities that came along with that. Um, so we would consider Homo erectus to be the first hunter-gatherer. By about 800,000 years ago, Homo erectus was able to control and intentionally make fire. Um, and that was associated with a huge benefit. First of all, with the opportunistic scavenging that Australopiths were doing, <clears throat> that allowed for a jump in brain size with the emergence of Homo erectus. So Australopiths had a brain that wasn't very much bigger than chimpanzees. Chimpanzees are around 350 cubic centimeters for their brain volume. Australopiths were around 450 cubic centimeters for their brain volume. As early Homo emerged, we have Homo habilis, who was about 700 cubic centimeters, but Homo erectus was 900 cubic centimeters. So almost a doubling in brain size that came with uh, increasing kind of commitment to eating meat regularly. So having those calories, having that fat, because our brain is predominantly fat, um, that helped fuel human brain growth. But still, um, our modern brains are 1,350 cubic centimeters, which is a 400 cubic centimeter jump from Homo erectus, really. So you know, we see other trends in our evolutionary history that allow for that further growth in brain size. We're not really hunting more than Homo erectus was, but what we started doing was cooking our meat. And what that does is that makes the nutrients from the meat readily bioavailable. So think about if you've ever gotten a tough cut of meat. My dad always gets a pork thing called a picnic. Um, and that may be an East Coast reference, I have no idea, but it's very tough, gristly, lots of connective tissue cut of pork. And the way that he fixes it is uh, basically by stewing it, right? That by cooking it for a very long time over low heat, he does it in the crock pot. Then he separates all the meat and adds barbecue sauce and you end up with your uh, really, really delicious Carolina pulled pork. But 
what we do with cuts of meat that are rough. I mean, these are not the things that we turn into like steak tartare or that we eat rare, right? These are the things that we cook often in fluid for a very long period of time to break it down. Um, that heat breaks down the connective tissue. Interestingly, the same is true for our vegetable materials, okay? We are not able to digest cellulose. Um, and so, I mean, it's part of what makes veggies like very fiber filled is this uh, composition of cellulose. So what do we mean by cellulose? Think about a stalk of celery, okay? The strings, right? We can't really digest the strings. Uh, we can't break down a lot of plant material when we eat it raw. That's one reason why it's so good for making yourself feel full but losing weight, right? Because it fills up your stomach with bulk. Um, but a lot of that you can't actually digest, so it just comes out in your poo. So when we cook vegetables, we break down the cellulose before we ever consume it. So those nutrients from our vegetables also become more readily bioavailable when we cook it. So um, cooking was a huge uh, evolutionary advantage when that emerged about 800,000 years ago. This high quality protein of meat, and, and even more important than protein is the fat, supported the evolution of our ever larger and increasingly complex brains. Our digestive system also became more flexible to sustain an omnivorous diet, which allowed us to live in incredibly diverse environments. Now, there are some human, not universals per se, but human trends, okay? We are adaptable. We are able to eat nearly everything, but the range of things that we actually do eat is narrower and follows some uh, predictable patterns. Most human groups around the world eat plants and animals. Um, there are no hunter-gatherer populations that exist now or have existed in at least the past two to 300,000 years that were vegetarian. Now, does that mean we can't be vegetarian now? Of course not, right? You can quite successfully be a lacto-ovo vegetarian, which is where you consume milk and eggs, and you don't really have a lot of concerns with your proteins, with your fats, uh, with your specifically B12. You can also be vegan, which I was for like 12 years um, before I ever had kids. And being vegan, however, is a lot harder to kind of maintain that nutrient balance. Um, vegans often fall short on protein. Um, they often fall short on fat. They often or critically fall short on vitamin B12. Uh, in uh, it's severe enough that really, if you want to live as a vegan, you need to supplement B12 with you know over the counter like multi B vitamins. So uh, we didn't evolve to be to eat in a diet completely devoid of animal products. Um, there are a few human populations who consist almost solely on meat. Um, these are our Arctic foragers, so the Inuit. The uh, the Sami of like Norway and Finland, Siberia. Um, these are populations that evolved either to hunt sea mammals like seals, like whales, etc., or um, have a commensal relationship with things like reindeer. Um, that's what the Sami do is they, uh, they're reindeer herders. And so they're consuming mostly um, animal products from their reindeer. And um, interestingly, these populations have distinct biological adaptations um, that enable them to consume a diet that's higher in animal products. Uh, they don't tend to get heart disease when they're consuming animal products, but interestingly, when they're converted to standard kind of American or Western diets, um, they end up with massive rates of heart disease. Um, one other way that they're able to get by is <clears throat> a lot of the um, animals that they eat, you think about whales in particular, um, they, the baleen whales consist on plankton, which means that there's a lot of vegetable material. So what lions and, and other obligate carnivores do uh, is they eat the stomach contents of the animals they hunt. And Arctic foragers do the same thing um, by eating the stomach and intestinal contents of the animals they hunt, they're able to uh, get some carbohydrate intake as well. So, you know, some neat biological and cultural shifts that enable them to have those diets of upwards of about 80% meat. Um, and if that's not healthy for most people, right? Most of us don't have either those cultural adaptations or those biological adaptations. So most human groups eat plants and animals. Generally, it's 
between about 40% animal, 60% vegetable, or you know, to, to about 60% animal, 40% vegetable. Um, we find that, that range of composition. Meals are typically formed around a core legume fringe pattern. So the core being your meat, the legume being your beans, etc. cetera. Um, the fringe being other kinds of things added in. Um, this meets biological needs with balanced nutrition and cult the cultural needs through variety and flavor. So we don't just eat like one thing. You don't sit down and just eat, I don't know, a turkey leg at like the state fair or something like that, right? Um, you pair your foods together. You're often consuming carbs with your proteins and fat. So you've got meat, but you've also got vegetables that have been stewed with that meat. Um, and so culture and biology interact in complex ways to create typical human diets that are very culturally specific. So what we have pictured here is a typical Ethiopian diet. Um, Ethiopian and um, Eritrean food centers around this spongy bread-like thing. Um, I'm trying to recall the name of it. I think it's called injiri. Um, I'm looking that up real quick while I talk. Um, but I can't spell while I'm typing. Um, it is, injera, uh, is this white leavened Ethiopian bread that's made from teff flour. So uh, Ethiopian or Eritrean food often has this bread base, and then you put different toppings on it. Some of those toppings will be stewed meat, some of those toppings will be legumes, some of those toppings will be uh, vegetable, and you eat with your hands. So you tear off a bit of bread that has some filling around it, consume those together. Um, most Americans, I don't know, I can't even say that. I mean, most don't, I mean, we eat with utensils predominantly, though there are certain foods that certainly are uh, hand foods. You don't generally cut your pizza with a fork and knife, right? Um, so, you know, we, we, but we view their way of eating and it's foreign, it's exotic, it's, you know, different from what we consume. Culture can actually lead to um, biological evolution. When we talk about some pretty recently evolved traits like um, lactose persistence, uh, being able to consume dairy products as adults. Uh, lactase is an enzyme that people have. We all are born with it, okay? Um, and what it is, is it's an enzyme that breaks down lactose, which is a sugar from, found in milk. All mammals at birth have lactase. Think about it, why, right? Um, e breast milk, even human breast milk versus you know the milk that dogs make or cows make or whatever, all milks are high in lactose. Um, so all infants are born, whether they're animal, whether they're human, are born being able to digest lactose. They have this lactase enzyme. Um, but typically by the time um, individuals wean, their lactase production drops dramatically. And so most animals don't consume milk after that critical period of lactation, after their nursing relationship is terminated. Um, we don't talk in the US about lactase persistence, which is really the trait that evolved. What didn't evolve was lactose intolerance, but because we uh, in the US have had such public health measures like milk, it does the body good, right? Um, we have the pervasive assumption, um, and it's reinforced through like doctors, and particularly pediatricians, we have this assumption that we should continue to eat dairy products for the rest of our lives. They're high in calcium, they're high in protein, uh, they have varying degrees of fat. Um, that's not really the norm. Um, and when we look across the planet, we find some predictable patterns of lactase persistence. Um, Interestingly, we inherited our, as particularly Americans of European origin, um, not Americans that are Native Americans or uh, descendants of Amerindian populations. <clears throat> it was European colonialists who brought lactase persistence to the New World, and um, it came from um, Middle Eastern herders that somewhere around about eight to 6,000 years ago started to push into Europe. Um, and so they brought with them because they were herding peoples. They were using predominantly animal products for the basis of their diet. Um, they displaced and interbred with European hunter-gatherers who were 
uh, presence and built then kind of the uh, historical European farm kind of uh, setup. Um, and so that interbreeding with these Middle Eastern herders carried lactase persistence into European populations, which then when they colonized the New World, brought that with them. So in, a, in the United States, for example, it's very rare. I mean, even Mexico, Brazil, it's very rare that people don't drink milk. In other areas of the world, that's not true. A lot of uh, individuals from East Asia and Southeast Asia do not have lactase persistence. Milk is not something uh, that they consume throughout their lives. So um, part of that is because they have different genetic origins. And part of that is because your ability to digest lactose is also contingent upon your consumption of lactose. So the more milk you drink, the more your body produces lactase to allow you to break down the milk sugars that are present. Um, the less milk you drink. So for example, after I was vegan for 12 years, when I added dairy products back in um, because I was pregnant, I had horrible stomach woes, right? My body had basically forgotten or shut off that ability to produce lactase uh, and then digest lactose. So we've got this interplay of um, how behavioral changes, cultural changes can even affect biology. Um, so does milk do a body good? Not necessarily. Milk can do a body good. Uh, if you've got the underlying genetic predisposition to lactase persistence, and if you have regular, not necessarily high milk consumption, but consistent milk consumption, then you can digest the milk, you can get nutrients from it. But there are people who rather than being labeled lactose intolerant and kind of different or weird, right, um, simply don't have those underlying genetic pathways and, and that cultural kind of expectation of drinking milk. So milk is not universally good for everybody. If it causes a stomach ache, guess what? Don't drink it. Don't consume dairy products. So what we consider the norm is actually abnormal when we look at the human species as a whole. Um, so a particular genetic mutation, a particular cultural environment that fostered then the consumption of dairy products. So for our first thinking critically prompt, I mean, we are able to, as a species, adapt to different environments to get the nutrition we need. Not all human diets are optimal for human health. Can you think of examples of human dietary practices that don't maximize health? And so then conjecture about why people might maintain dietary practices that can make them sick or even die. Um, I can think of a few off the top of my head, right? Doritos and Dr. Pepper, right? Um, a diet that is uh, heavily focused on processed foods. They taste good, don't they, right? Um, we want to consume that stuff. However, it is detrimental to our human health. So really the, a lot of what we get at grocery stores is um, counterproductive for overall human health and longevity. Um, even a focus on um, domesticated plants and animals, right? Conventional agriculture. Our food is becoming less nutritious because the soil that it's growing in is depleted because it's exposed to uh, environmental pollutants, both in terms of soil, air, and water. Um, and because we've shifted towards less nutritively dense uh, like produce, for example. Our produce is basically mostly water. If you've ever had the opportunity to eat an heirloom product versus a uh, conventionally grown mass-produced agricultural product, so like an heirloom tomato versus just a regular run-of-the-mill tomato that you pick up at the grocery store, the difference in flavor is night and day. Um, we've raised our kids. We buy into um, a program called Skarsgård Farms, which is a community-supported agriculture program. So we don't buy very much produce at the store. We get a box of produce delivered weekly um, that is focused on local and regionally grown products. And Monty Skarsgård is the guy who kind of led or spearheaded this program. Um, and you know, they, they've branched out into not only produce, but like locally ranched beef and lamb and uh, really some phenomenal stuff. It's night and day difference. It tastes so much better. Um, think about you know, sushi, right? Sushi's delicious. It's probably one of my favorite foods, if not my favorite food. But 
um, you can make yourself sick by consuming uncooked fish products, particularly if those fish have either been exposed to environmental pollutants or um, aren't refrigerated or kept at uh, temperatures that allow it to remain fresh or if it's stored for too long, right, that promotes bacterial growth or microbial growth. So, you know, why do we do it? Think about your diet. What do you eat or drink that's counterproductive for your optimal health? I mean, I guarantee you it's not just going to be one or two things, right? Um, any candy, any sodas, um, any processed foods, I mean, a lot of that really doesn't do anything for us nutritionally. The other kind of side of the other side of the coin here is uh, that there are a lot of things that are eaten by populations around the world that we find simply disgusting. Um, you know, so if you were to do a, a mind game here and classify the following items as either food or not food, cheese, rotten shark flesh, buffalo penis stew, caterpillars, oysters, spiders, porcupine, or hamburger, you would probably say that cheese is food, that oysters are food and that hamburger is food. Most of you would probably be a little repulsed by rotten shark flesh, buffalo penis stew, caterpillars, spiders, maybe even porcupine. I mean, porcupine's kind of that interesting in the middle thing, right? If you hunt, you might be willing to eat porcupine, but if you base your diet on what you can buy at Smith's, probably not gonna eat porcupine. So the fact that one group of people can find things disgusting that others consider delicious illustrates how culture shapes our food preference. And specifically, I mean, when you reflect upon your comfort foods, it's going to be things that you ate during your childhood. For me, it is tomato soup and grilled cheese. That is like my ultimate co uh, comfort food, because that's what I would, my mom would fix for me when I was sick, when I was sad, etc. Like I, I really love, but it's got to be honestly for me, and it's horrible, it's got to be the condensed tomato soup from Campbell's. It can't be like a different brand of soup. It can't be something that's more tomato-y. It has to be like that, you guys know what the condensed soup consistency is like, right? To me, that is the ultimate comfort food. So ideas about what is food or is not food are closely tied to these processes of cultural construction, symbolism, group identity, and cultural change. Do you know what could revolutionize uh, human food security around the world? if we could all just get over our hang up about eating insects. Insects are incredibly renewable because they have such fast intergenerational spans, right? They can reproduce at phenomenal rates, have thousands of babies uh, every generation and generations might only be a week uh, to a year um, in between. Um, so insects are available in extreme abundance. They're really high protein. Insect larvae have really high fat content. Um, I have, I've eaten stir fried crickets and grasshoppers. I've eaten ants. Um, I have eaten insect larvae. The insect larvae is probably for me the, the biggest hurdle to cross there um, because there's two ways that you eat it. You either swallow them whole and you can feel them crawling down your esophagus or you bite the head off, spit it out, and then suck out all the juices from the rest of the body. And that just is a, a weird flavor and texture that is not necessarily, don't, I don't necessarily find that delicious, but you know, honestly, a stir fry made with grasshoppers or crickets, it's got veggies in it served over rice, you can't really tell the difference. I mean, you can with your eyes, but if you were blindfolded, you would think it was crunchy. You would think it was like, you know, um, kind of a nutty flavor sort of thing. So, you know, we, we would revolutionize uh, food security if we could just get over our hang up about eating uh, eating insects. We could have insect farms. I mean, heck, you can go to Clark's and buy, you know, like two dozen crickets and have kind of your self-sustaining cricket population. Um, and they're not that expensive. So yeah. Um, all right. So what do we mean by foodways? Well, foodways as a term is relatively recent in anthropology, but it's looking at how food interacts with other types of culture and how food really has a long history Right? When we think about traditions that carry over from generation to generation, food is a big one for any of you who identify with the term Hispanic, right? Food is love, really. Um, and that's not just true for Hispanics, but is especially true for Hispanics here in New Mexico, right? You think back about your to, to like times with your abuela, right? Homemade tortillas, making tamales at Christmas. Um, 
you know, pozole, all of these traditional comfort foods that um, remind you of grandma, that remind you of holidays, that remind you of family gatherings. Anglos in New Mexico don't always have that same connotation. Heck, the only family I have here is the family that we started here. So, you know, it's not, I, cooking in New Mexico doesn't bring back to me like um, family traditions. So the term foodways rather than just food recognizes that it's an entire pathway towards how we interact with food. It's not just the nitty gritty of what food do we eat, but it's about all these other cultural practices that go into a, a, a accruing food, cooking food and consuming food. Food is really like the penultimate social experience. We are not meant to uh, to have the lights down low and be by ourselves on our couch with Netflix and a bag of Doritos, right? We are meant to have communal food production, to have communal cooking, to have communal meals that last for hours. Uh, so really putting this holistic and kind of his, like cultural history that's associated with food. Foodways are culturally constructed. They're always permeated by cultural beliefs. They're governed by systematic rules and etiquette. So for example, what animals are considered huntable per se? There was a longstanding history of um, a religious taboo among South American Amerindians uh, against eating deer. Um, interestingly, I mean, they, they would tied into their religious mythology where there had been a, a spirit in heaven who'd gotten cast out of heaven and then sent back down to the forest and took the form of a deer. And so if you killed a deer, there was a chance that you were eating a god um, and that wasn't considered a good thing. But interestingly, as soon as shotguns were introduced, as soon as we shifted from bow and arrow hunting to firearms, that taboo went away. So, you know, it's kind of interesting how cultural changes can dramatically change what people eat. But, you know, these rules about what you can hunt, um, what plants you grow. There was a tradition, I mean, the corn maiden stories of, uh, of ancestral Puebloans. Uh, there's a lot of tradition associated with the types of corns that you plant, where and when you plant the corn, the religious ceremonies that then center around both planting the corn and harvesting the corn. Um, there are rituals, uh, rules that govern how you share, prepare, and eat food. Right? If you identify as Jewish, then you may or may not follow kosher. If you identify as Islamic, you may or may not follow halal. Um, you know, rules about you can't pair beef and dairy together, for example, because it goes against kosher uh, principles for you to potentially eat both a product from the mother and the baby, which is the, really what, what is that component of not having like a cheeseburger, for example, because the milk that produced the cheese could have also been the milk that nourished the cow that you were then eating. So, you know, these rules are culturally constructed. There's no reason why biologically you can't put a slice of cheese on your burger, right? Um, it, it's not biologically significant, but it's very, very culturally significant. And these rules vary from one society to the next. So uh, those of us who live in a modern context are what we call supermarket economies, right? Capitalism, woo! Um, the, we are very divorced from what actually goes into producing our food. We view food as a material good. Generally, we don't view food as spiritually significant. However, indigenous populations do. Their religious mythologies is centered around how they produce and consume their food. Um, we have a component of that in modern America as well. You know, Christian ideology with uh, Eucharist, for example, right? That is essentially a ceremony surrounding food, the consumption of uh, the bread, of the wine, of the body and, and blood of Christ. Um, in many indigenous populations, the Hua included, um, food has mystical properties. Food can be an aphrodisiac. Isn't that what we think about with oysters and dark chocolate, right? Probably not together. That doesn't sound very appetizing. Um, so it's actually abnormal that we in a modern context have divorced our food from our spiritual practices, okay? And when you divorce your food from your spiritual practices, you are much more likely to gravitate towards foods that aren't very healthy for you, right? Um, we don't have a lot of mysticism associated with our metaphorical Doritos and Coke. 
so we tend to think of our supermarket economy and our material definition of food as the norm when in reality we are the abnormal. So among the Hua, eating food unites the consumer with the people who produced it. It imbues them with the essence of the organisms that they're consuming. Very common among indigenous um, populations that hunt that there is some sort of prayer or ceremony that's done when you kill a prey animal. Um, and it ties into their animist religions where animals have spirits, ancestors have spirits, all life on earth is spiritually and energetically tied to one another.